I'm David Velasco. I'm the editor-in-chief of Artform magazine, and I'm here with Arthur Jaffa, who is the cover star of our September AJ, AJ <laughs> cover star of our September issue, um, which is also our 60th anniversary issue. Um, <laughs> it's beautiful, I think. Thank you for being here. You know, I showed it to my brother where I showed him a JPEG of it, and it's like, you know, I got my picture on the cover, Rolling Stone, a little bit. I mean, it, <laughs> it feels like that a bit. It's know? clear, too. I mean, it's clear that you've spent a lot of time thinking about and working with images. I mean, yeah. that is, you know, the impact of the films that you make, also just the static art you make, mm -hmm. as I saw when I went to Arles mm -hmm. for the, you know, yeah. for the show Live yeah. Evil, which yeah. is you know, which is the best show I saw this year. It was really incredible. You know, it wasn't necessarily what I expected. I have thought of you mostly as a moving image yeah. artist. Yeah. And here I was in this space, or these two spaces, right. in, at the Luma Arles, where you had somehow done what you do in the moving image realm in the space. Right. You know, and that was incredible to see. I mean, it's like one of my oldest off-sighted things is like my friend John Aconfra. He just says, look, hey, we just want to put some things in some affective proximity to one another. That is like, when he said that, it crystallized something about, you know, not even my practice. Like, what is the compulsion that precedes your practice? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, you put a thing next to another thing. And then I've thought about all the kind of relationships to that. Everything from a slave ship, where people who are black, even though they weren't black at the time, they were Africans of different ethnicities, are chained together and what that creates. You know what I mean? That's affective proximity. That's things, I mean, Fred Moe used the term besidedness, you know, besideness. And then Hortense Spillers has talked about the difference between the body and flesh and how it has something to do with uh, empathy. You know, empathy which is just another thing of like, how do you feel a thing? How does yeah. a thing have affective capacity and so the split between the moving image thing and as you said static things it was never like for me like oh now i'm going to do this new thing these are all things that i was always like preoccupied with ne never you know greater or lesser you know i'm a little bit uh intransigent i don't like i don't like boxes i don't want to be boxed so with the ghidra it's actually you know it's unlike the other moving image works I know of yours right. in that it's not about juxtaposition of right. uh, other images right. or pre-existing images. Yeah. It's about the creation of this new digital right. world. Right. And so you're all, you're like definitely moving outside of what we had already you know, right. thought you right. were doing. Right. Um, how did that happen? Like I could trace very quickly. It was like love is a message. And then they did a kingdom come at ass. With something like a kingdom come at ass, yeah, very really it was like, it's not going to be love as a message. It's going to be fucking out two hours long, and it's not, you know, and it's not going to give people what I say microwave epiphanies about what they think it is to be black or something like that. And then after that, I did the White Album, which was a kind of, okay, I went to one other extreme, so now let me try to find a middle ground between A Kingdom Coming Fast and Love is a Message. Ghidra is like, it's not found footage. It's not even footage. It's actually because it's digital. Mm -hmm. It was all created in the computer. You know, and the biggest thing I had when I was working with Booth, 
the special effects company that I work with. In the beginning, they were like, well, what is it? And I was like, I don't know. And I think that was a really new process for them where we just right. talked and I sent them pictures and we talked about the pictures and they interpreted the pictures and I was like, oh, interesting. And I would say things super specific like, okay, it's a wave. So that's where we would start. But then I was like, but it's not really a wave though. You know, it's um, the North American continent fragmented into a million bits. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, but hold up, is Miles Davis's skin stretched over the Atlantic Ocean? And I remember the first when I said that, they laughed. And then, so that started moving it in another direction. And then I would say, well, you know, do you know anything about the Middle Passage, the slave trade? They used to, there's this thing called Drexia, where they say uh, the pregnant women who were thrown overboard or jumped overboard, they gave birth to these babies underwater and they created this underwater civilization. And to me, a Gidra was supposed to be all of those things. A good friend of mine saw it just last week for the first time and said, uh, it's dope because you can't tell if it's a thousand years before man or a thousand years after man. Well, where does the title come from? Is there the like title <laughs> is a kind of uh, automatist, uh, auto automatic, like allusion to uh, Japanese horror films. I was in Tokyo with my son and uh, Godzilla was in the theater. And they asked me, they said, wow, that's, what, is that? what is Godzilla about? What's that about, you know? And I said, oh, Japanese people are the only people who've ever had an A-bomb dropped on them. And those monster movies were about them on some psychosocial level trying to process mm -hmm. what that means. You know, not just the initial flash, but the aftermath, you know, because Godzilla is an atomic thing. It sure. comes out of the water, just destroys everything. Yeah. It's like 911 over and over and over again compulsively. So I said, that's them trying to process that. And I and so I one of the things I definitely thought about with the geezer was like, one, is it possible to embody if Godzilla is an embodiment of A bombs, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, is it possible is it possible to create an embodiment of the black experience, the horrors of it? Is right. that possible? So like a lot of times people will say a Gija is a landscape and I was like, yes, it is a fragmented landscape. In the same way when people say it's a wave, I say, well, it's not really a wave though because it's all, you know, strata. Yeah. I said, but that's an organism to me, like one of my readings of it. There's also a sonic component, which is, right. you know, as powerful as the visual, you know, yeah. and I think that that is sitting there being with the sound um, while you're watching this is such an unbelievable experience. Yeah. I wonder if you could actually just talk a little bit about how the sound was made. Like in that nighttime sequence and stuff, um, you know, like I who am nothing, like it's to me one of the high points of it. Mm -hmm. It does a lot of things. Like it slows it down so you can hear the tenor of the voices singing. It shifts the gender dynamics in it because it's Roberta Flack and Donnie Hathaway. But in a Gidra, it's two guys singing to each other. Yeah, I see. Yeah, totally. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Even if it wasn't consciously intentional, you know, oh, when I pitch shifted this down, it didn't just slow it down, it made it two guys singing to each other rather than Roberta Flack and Donny Hathaway singing to each other. And the work is also, it's devoted to Greg Tate. Um, well. And I, or at least at, at, in Arles, that's what it was, that was. Well, what I would say about it is this, and I haven't said this in public too much because it's such an overdetermined reading of it. Sure. I, I, I become a little wary that it's going to, like I said, this is going to level everything else. Right. Because it really is a reading, and this is really just straight up metaphysics. I don't know what else to call it. Like, when I look at it now, it feels like it was a pre premonition of my friend dying. And it's a reading of it that has kind of entrenched itself for me. 
Sure. Like between me and his daughter, like Shannara, like uh, the last day that it screened up in Harlem was two days after we had uh, Greg's service. Right. And, um, and Shannara called me about 10 o'clock and said, hey, Jam Uptown, because we, we kept the uh, spaces open to midnight that last weekend. She said, I'm going to see the piece. You want to go? And I was happy to be down the street. So we went, and we looked at it three times in a row. So we walked out of there at 3 something in the morning, and she talked the whole time during those three. And her, Greg's grandson was playing in the corner. He eventually fell asleep. And a lot of what she said was she related to me conversations she had with her dad about a Ghidra that I didn't really have opportunity to talk to him about because it was up. And then he, you know, he died. So we didn't. Yeah. We had a little conversation about it, but she was like, he thought it was a real, um, like you had accomplished something. A lot of my aesthetic agendas are just they're just so bound up and intertwined with Greg. You know what I mean? They just all totally. Um, not to say he set them or anything, but we just had mutual preoccupations. And you were in conversation this whole time, like that's. All the time, yeah, all the time. And so, you know, we would have had those conversations, but he was just happy. He could see that it was, that I had actually, because the other thing, even on the title, like a Ghidra, so I said the one thing is the Japanese monster movies, but it also is a very, some almost overt nod to the Miles Davis record. Miles arguably being, the single most thought about figure collectively b between the two of us. I remember I got in trouble with some older friends because at one point it was like, Miles Davis is a super sign of black consciousness. And they rejected that <laughs> because they were talking about the man. They knew the man. Yeah. I was just saying, Miles is such an interesting figure because he goes against the grain on so many hardcore levels. So just even on that level, you know, him being this jet black, guy who wore Brooke brother suits at one point, so you know what I mean, who stood with his back to the audience, like the complexity of that as a gesture. Like I used to say, improvisation and jazz, before it's a musical gesture, it's a philosophical gesture. Sure. But for a black person to stand up and say, no, we're making this up in front of you. Even if we're taking somebody else's tune, we are recreating it. That's the kind of self-determinacy that's so at odds with how black people typically get situated. Right. And for Miles to do with his back to the audience is really deep. Yeah. No, it's fucking with like the relationship to audience on like every level. It's the opposite of Math of X. Every time you go in the room, you have to sit with your back to the wall so you can see who's coming to kill you. So we thought about Miles so long. And the one record of all the records that we talked about and thought about the most was this record he did called Ag Harta. Ag Harta. Ah, OK. I see. So Gidra Eckhart, A-G-H is the first. So he was also your ideal audience in like a lot of ways. He was the embodiment of my ideal audience. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so much of this is about who you're in conversation with, like mm -hmm. who you're talking to, who your right. audience is. Like right. that's, you know, Amy Tobin's another great audience of yours. Uh, she, she, made, she, she made me. I mean, you know, in the maker, like there's yeah. certain people who you read at a certain point and it's funny, like, uh, you know, you're talking to him and saying, I think you're interesting. It's like, yeah, you think I'm interesting because so much of my thinking was formulated by reading Amy's take on, you know, particularly avant-garde cinema. I mean, and Amy's also called Aguidra, you know, a movie masterpiece, and, you know, and she means it, you know, which is high praise. It's funny, you know, because the, the 60th anniversary issue, I, I started thinking about a lot about the market, and then I actually switched gears and made this theme about love's work, yeah. trying to actually bring up why it is that artists do this, why it is that, like, how you can create a space that's kind of, even though these transactional things are mm -hmm. happening all the time, and even though, like, the work side of it is so important, like, where is also, I mean, the love, like, where is, it's kind of cheesy, but it's also, I think it's important, like, what is, what is it that makes art special, what is it that we do it for? I mean, just coming up, you know, our forum was the magazine I read, I mean, you know, and at Mitchell's son. Like, I mean, honestly, because I think I came into it probably through the film thing to a certain degree. 
But you know, in the course in the course of reading, of course, you see. I mean, I remember like uh, Renee Ricard's, you know, the first Boss Guy piece, classic. Right. Mm -hmm. I can remember like literally walking with Greg in New York in '81 or '82, and this is when John Michelle's thing was like. It's hard to describe how John Michelle's thing sat in black folks or in black artists because it wasn't just bound up with who he was or how talented he was. It was bound up with, you knew, like, it was like, you know, the tip of the iceberg. It was like the Katrina was, it was like the first drop in Katrina. Like, it signaled something that felt inevitable because mostly what it signaled is the sort of art world as a preserve for a white man was about to be over. I always think of like, I love World War Z, that movie with Brad Pitt. Okay. You know, uh, you yeah, know and yeah, it's got yeah. the incredible scene where they're like in, um, in Israel or something and all the zombies are trying to scale the wall. Right. Yeah. Like to me, that's how I feel like, that's how we are now. It's just <laughs> the first zombie, it was the first zombie to scale the wall. <laughs> but it was like a tor you know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. like a, a tsunami behind them. And yeah. so I think it was super exciting. It's hard to describe to people what it feels like to be in a world where you're not allowed to do what you're capable of doing just because you're black. And, and I, maybe I'm putting it too plainly, but when I was 21, there were no black artists in the art world. There were black artists all over the place, but they were not allowed to have a career. It was like South Africa. It was like apartheid. It was like rigid and, and absolute. And it wasn't because, because I've had this conversation with Gavin, and I've started to have it with Barbara a little bit. It was like, it didn't seem like there were any, there was nobody creative around. Like one of the first right. things I asked Gavin was like, how come you never had any black artists? Your gallery was the coolest fucking gallery to me. You know what I mean? But there were, and when I would go into the spaces, it was like the cool kids or something. But I was like, there's no black artists here. What is that? What do you make of that? Sometimes I would just put it like, you want to make an artifact where if a Christian was confronted with it, they would fall to their knees. But if a Muslim was confronted with it, they would fall to their knees. Or a Zen Buddhist, they would all fall to their knees. Like, how do you make a thing that has enough, I don't know what the term would be, but internal coherency or something that it can actively stand in for all these different, you know, so, so that's what it was an attempt to do. It was like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's got something to do with Casper David Friedrich. And all. it's obvious the cover makes that super explicit. Very uh, romantic. Yeah, super romantic. So you're trying to make something sublime. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely.